What happens to your body when you walk a lot? What if a lot is like a lot, a lot? I'd like to explore the science, the physiology, and some personal experience on the effects walking has on your health. Now, while I do love walking, I actually roped Robin into discussing her experience around walking 20,000 steps per day. Oh, if you don't know who Robin is, here's an introduction. Hey guys, it's Robin, and welcome to the Science of Self-Care. On this channel, we talk about all things science, self-care, and wellness, and today I want to share my experience of walking 20,000 steps for the past 30 days. So, what are the benefits of walking from Robin's perspective? And then let's dive into the science of self-care, one might even say. For people who are trying to lose weight, I've now read through so many thousands of comments on my videos. Um, and a lot of people have successfully lot, lost a lot of weight through walking. And I think one of the beautiful things about walking is that you are at a very low intensity, able to move your body, activate your muscles a little bit, burn a few extra calories without becoming so ravenous in a way that a high intensity exercise activity might. So let's discuss the science of that for a moment, weight loss. It probably seems intuitive that if you move more, you'll use more energy through your muscles, thereby allowing you to lose more body fat. And if we crack open a study on the topic, this was a simple design. One group was put on a 1000 calorie deficit diet and the other group was put on the exact same diet, but incorporated walking. If we open the data, we can see the circle data is the diet only group and the square data is the walking group. Over 12 weeks, both groups lost weight. We don't need statistics for that one, but what we're really interested in is the difference between the two groups. For that, we need to compare the circle and the square at the 12 week mark. And for this, we need to pull in the stats machine, which is simply done by focusing our attention on the time X treatment interaction. The cutoff for the statistical significance is 0.05, and yet we see a value is above 0.05, indicating there's no likely effect. So does that mean that walking doesn't do what Robin and hundreds of our viewers have experienced? The grand walking conspiracy? No. The study was probably underpowered, meaning it didn't have enough data due to not having enough participants to detect an effect. But we also don't care as much about weight loss as we do fat loss. And in that regard here, we see the fat mass measurements. Remember, DI is the diet intervention. Notice that both groups start around the same weight, which is important. But at the end of the 12 weeks, the walking condition lost 1.6 kilograms or three and a half more pounds than the dieting group. And yes, this was statistically significant, indicating a likely effect. So no grand walking conspiracy by the sedentarites on planet sedentary. It works. But there are some unconventional ways walking might help your health. Let's return to Robin. One more health thing I want to mention is that I really feel like when I'm walking a lot in a day, I sleep so well, and that is not something to be ignored. I think sleep makes such a big difference in overall health, and yeah, I just sleep more soundly and deeply when I've walked a lot in a day. I really noticed this also uh, as I was just on vacation last week, and there was one day where I walked a lot around Kyoto and I didn't do anything else in the day, but I still ended that day with an accomplished feeling and I slept beautifully because I had just moved my body. Sleep, a critical component of health. So what do studies have to say about sleep improvement when walking then? Well, studies have been done to find out the effect like this one. In this study, participants had their steps counted and were assessed for sleep quality before and after one month of step counting. Then the researchers related sleep quality to step count. Here is that data. You'll notice the three buckets of walking, low, average, and high. You'll notice the sleep quality index on the vertical axis, and you'll also notice that women were the only ones that experienced an improvement in sleep quality. This could be for a number of reasons. 
One, women may just receive an outsized benefit. Two, the study was mostly in women, so it may not have been powered for men. Power being the same definition as earlier in the weight loss study. Now, three, since we don't have absolute numbers, only buckets or categories, it's possible that the men walked less, even in the high group. What I can say is that other studies on exercise like this one indicate improved sleep from exercise, but that's also incorporating biking, Pilates, and other forms of physical activity. So it isn't exactly one-to-one. -one. Back to Robin for something that might be news to you. But I've also noticed that a walk after dinner, I personally think also really helps with digestion and kind of the glycemic impact of your dinner. So when I do walk after dinner and then sleep, I feel like it's a different biochemical experience than if I walk and then eat and then sleep. So there is also, I think, something to going for a walk after your last meal that's really nice uh, in maybe managing your blood sugar and getting your body out of a digestive state. I don't know. This is, again, speculative, but uh, it's something I've noticed. I, I feel pretty good also the next morning when I wake up if I've walked after dinner. There are several studies on this. I actually was just reading one. So it is a thing that, you know, walking after a meal can help. I think this study was called attenuate the glycemic impact of a meal. Robin and I are not insane. There is such research, and by Robin's keen memory, here is that study. And simply, they had people consume carbohydrates and then walk immediately afterwards, compared against several other conditions. Here is that data. We're comparing against control, or C-O-N, here. If there is a symbol above the bar, that means there is a statistically significant effect. Now, you'll notice that the three graphs look quite similar, except for the walk condition on the left graph does show reduced blood sugar. So why not the other two? The reason is simply the time of measurement. The left graph is after two hours, the middle is after three hours, and the furthest right is immediately after the meal. All in all, this means walking flattens out our blood sugar spike, but may not have a big impact on the total blood sugar. And then again, it's also possible the study was underpowered. I hate to say it again, but one could argue it here as well. Still, I mentioned in my discussion with Robin, the glucose, sugar entering the bloodstream from a food consumption is probably being sequestered by the leg muscle cells, which take up glucose molecules using transporters called glute. These glute transporters can be activated by insulin as carbohydrates would stimulate the release of insulin from the pancreas but they can also be activated by muscle stimulation like walking. You might be wondering why the other conditions like squats didn't have similar effects. There are multiple reasons from insufficient intensity to insufficient duration to the study being underpowered to detect a more mild effect. Anyway, walking post-meal does seem to provide some effect in blunting a blood sugar spike. That said, this topic could go on for a while, and I'll cover more in the future, but this scientific review goes through a host of benefits from blood pressure reduction, uh, lowering blood lipoproteins, improved cognition, reduced dementia risk, reduced cancer risk, better bone health, and some of the topics that we discussed earlier, including mental health, which is something that Robin and I discussed, but I didn't add it uh, to this discussion. So, walking has a host of benefits. Again, I'll dive into the physiological mechanisms in more depth in the future, so stay tuned for that. But I also wanted to ask Robin about potential pitfalls and things to look out for, especially for beginners. Not that we're beginners to walking, but some are likely beginners to walking tens of thousands of steps. It's important to note that I have and had been walking a lot before I decided to do 20,000 steps a day. And I get some messages from people that are currently walking 5,000. And then I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going straight to 20,000 because then I think you might experience some issues in your foot or your knee. But because I've been doing it consistently and slowly building it up over time, I feel really good in my feet and knees, but I do make sure to replace my shoes very regularly. And when I do go for longer walks 
to wear great quality shoes. And that's something, yeah, if you're a casual walker, you may not think, oh, I, I should get really nice shoes for walking. But if you are going to be walking so much every day and week and month, uh, making sure you have shoes that work for your feet are, it's very important and replacing them regularly. That's kind of one negative part of walking is having to buy new shoes a lot, but it's kind of part of the, it's a trade-off. I think this is an excellent point. Something that I don't consider enough myself, making sure that you're using the right shoes and what are the right shoes, Nick, Robin. I recommend based on personal experience and also having done a lot of running in the past that running shoes are a great walking shoe, especially walking around the city. I think running shoes are just built for endurance and are usually helping avoid that compression as much as possible. Do you, uh, what do you look for actually? I'm curious, we can get real tactical here. <laughs> <laughs> oh or, man, or, I hope yeah. I can answer this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what do you look for when you're, you're looking for shoes? You said running shoes, but like, uh, is there a particular, not, not even necessarily a brand, but like, is there like, do you go for like cushion, cushionier yeah. shoes? So or? This is really based on personal experience or personal preference. I like shoes that are built for really long distances, which typically tend to be more cushiony. Uh, shorter distances are usually lighter and a little bit harder. I like cushion. I'm planning to walk hundreds of miles on these shoes. And so I go for the endurance running shoes. And then another question. And you said that you replace your shoes relatively often. Um, how, how often roughly do you, do you replace your shoes? So every few months, which is okay. a little bit shocking, but with the amount that I use them, it's kind of necessary. You're supposed to replace sh running shoes every like 300 miles. Let me just look this up. So I'm not spouting nonsense. Okay. So I'm not too, too far off it. This first hit recommends replacing running shoes between three to 500 miles. When I did cross country, I think I always learned that 300 miles is, it's better to err on the side of keeping your shoes fresh. It does get expensive and it is a little bit wasteful. Um, but it, if I don't, I, I start to feel it in, okay, so maybe this is what you were getting at earlier. I feel it in my knees and my feet if it's time to replace my running shoes. So I, I'm not actually calculating mile by mile, but I can just tell when these are done. It's time for a new pair. That certainly makes sense. The more you use it, the more the material wears down, increasing risk of small injuries. This next suggestion might not be for everyone, but if you want to supercharge the results that we just discussed on walking, you might also be interested in this other video that I did right here with Robin. And certainly check out Robin's channel. It's linked for you as well. Hope to speak with you again. Bye.